Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Gurit Brar. Uh, I am the Fresno and Madera County Nut Cross Farm Advisor uh, with UC Cooperative Extension. Uh, before I start my presentation, uh, I would like to uh, do a little self-promotion. Uh, my common symposium, uh, like every year, is coming up on May 28th in Kerman. So please make a note of this day. It's a Thursday, the Thursday of the Memorial Day week uh, in Kerman Community Center. Uh, the registration is open and the announcement got out uh, last week. Uh, so you have a little flyer on this table. Uh, you can uh, note down the website link or you can scan this little QR code with your smartphone and uh, register directly there. Uh, the registration is only $10. Uh, there will be lunch provided and uh, I have about seven speakers who will talk about different diseases, salinity issues, irrigation during drought, and laws and regulations, nitrogen budgeting, uh, mites, and neighbor Orima, to name uh, a few. Uh, so I will, uh, I will put uh, these flyers back. Uh, so now uh, I hope your season started well. Uh, we had some rain lately. Uh, while it was a much needed rain, but with the showers at this time of the year, uh, we should also be concerned about possible diseases in our orchard. So I am uh, passing these uh, handouts, uh, which I printed from the Almond uh, IPM guidelines by the UC IPM website. Uh, these uh, these pages have uh, fungicide efficacy tables for almonds. And uh, please disregard the second page of this, uh, actually uh, by mistake, uh, some guidelines from some other past came out. This. So page number one, three, and four, uh, they are the ones that I wanted uh, to um, give to you. Uh, these charts have the uh, fungicide efficacy for all the uh, fungicides uh, which are recommended by the UC um, IPM website. And it also has a little chart uh, with the treatment timings uh, for different uh, diseases. Uh, now, before I begin uh, an overview of uh, the springtime and summertime diseases in almonds, I would like to lay a little stress on monitoring. Uh, we always uh, emphasize monitoring because that is uh, what helps you control your disease situation in the orchard. And many of the diseases that I'm talking about today, uh, they can be controlled, managed, or restrained by proper timing of monitoring. For example, uh, dormant season spot sampling uh, is very important in disease monitoring, as well as uh, the sampling or monitoring during the fall season, previous fall season. Uh, so monitoring helps us uh, take a note of the population of the pathogen, uh, whether or not the disease inoculum is present. And then monitoring also helps us make decisions when to start management practices. And before that, monitoring also helps us track the growth in the pathogen population, whether the disease is spreading or whether it is getting constrained. And then proper timing and application rates and the choice of fungicides, they are very important. So it all comes from monitoring the situation, whether or not and how much inoculum is present. Uh, so Based on uh, our monitoring, we have different uh, treatment timings and uh, monitoring situations uh, based on different kind of diseases that we are looking for. And uh, we have basically three basic strategies. One is inoculum based. In some diseases, we look for the presence of inoculum, whether or not the inoculum is present, because that is what triggers the disease initiation and spread. And, and presence of inoculum is true in um, this strategy is uh, where in case of, uh, for example, shark hole, uh, which the inoculum can be carried, carried out to this spring throughout winter from the previous year. And the same is true for rust. If you had rust and shark hole inoculum in your orchard previous fall and you didn't uh, defoliate early and inoculum got carried away through winter to the spring, then an inoculum could be present and you can, by looking at your trees, you can monitor and you can make a decision uh, whether or not the disease is present and spreading. Another thing is uh, um, host phenology based monitoring. At some growth stages, phenological stages, like bloom or nut development or maturity, 
some, some diseases, some pathogens, their inoculum is already present in your orchard, but some phenological stages are more susceptible than the other. So the disease comes at a particular growth stage or a particular stage of development of uh, flowers or nuts. And uh, perfect examples for this is brown rot, blossom blight, which comes when the blossoms are very susceptible and the fungi attach those. And another example of this is hull rot, which is common bread mold. Uh, one of the pathogens causing hull rot is rhizopus, which is common bread mold. And it is present in the, uh, anoplum is present in the orchard, in the environment, uh, but they need that typical growth stage when the hull opens and the hull becomes susceptible to the pathogen. So uh, in those kind of diseases, we should be looking out when the susceptible uh, host stage is present. And the third is microclimate-based micro, microclimate based monitoring. Uh, for example, in case of alternate area, uh, during certain microclimatic stages, when we have high humidity, high moisture, and stagnant air, uh, that could trigger the spread of diseases like alternate area. So I will, uh, I will start with uh, uh, talking about the green fruit rot or jacket rot in almonds. Although this disease is, uh, it can start as early as pink bud to full bloom stage throughout parent fall. Uh, it is caused by three fungi and one of the fungus is Monilini laxa which, is, which also causes the brown, uh, brown uh, blossom rot. Uh, so this can infect your flowers and particularly at the senescence stage when the petals are senescing. Uh, what this does is uh, these three fungi, um, these can infect the, from the anthers, it can move to the petals and the falling petals can carry the anoculum down to the clusters uh, when they, uh, the petals don't, the infected petals don't fall on the ground and they are trapped in the clusters. And from there, it can move to the peduncles and into the nut, into the developing nut. Uh, so the developing nut, they can rot at the base, and if the nuts start rotting, they could fall off. So you could lose the crop. Uh, the good thing is, uh, if you have a good spray program for blossom blight um, during uh, full bloom, if you sometimes you can get away with one full bloom spray, and that can take care of uh, uh, this uh, disease as well. Uh, but if you have the symptoms of this disease and your monitoring shows that uh, you have the green uh, jacket rot in your orchard uh, and you want to apply fungicide, make sure uh, you choose those fungicides which are effective against all three of the pathogens. Uh, one note that DMIs, demethylation inhibitors, they are not effective against one of the uh, pathogens, which is called right scenario. Uh, so you should be, uh, based on uh, the literature that I provided to you, and you can look up uh, for more guidelines on the UC IPM website, uh, you can make a decision what fungicides to choose from. Another disease that I will be talking about is short hole. Short hole, uh, you're all familiar with the short hole symptoms. Uh, these lesions, uh, they turn um, round. Uh, specs and the lesions grow into brown lesions and they spread spores. This disease needs water splashes to grow. So that's why I was telling you that it is important to monitor this disease in the late fall rains uh, because the late fall rain splashes could help spread this disease and help spread the inoculum. Uh, so again, at this time of the year, if we have rain uh, in uh, this late, uh, you should be looking out for the symptoms, uh, and this could spread very quickly. This can also, um, so these lesions fall out in the young leaves and leave the holes, which we call the short holes, uh, but in older leaves, these lesions stay and the spores uh, produce. This short hole can also get on the hull of the developing nuts. These, these lesions on the hull, they have typical purple margins and they are little raised. And in the month of May, beginning, beginning in May, uh, this hull of the growing fruit, growing nut, it stops being susceptible to this disease. So this is the month that you should be looking for any symptoms on the fruit. The typical um, spray schedule is uh, what we call is two to five weeks after petal fall. 
So it depends on the inoculum, it depends on um, the decisions uh, you make based on your monitoring of the disease situation. Uh, but two to five weeks is a broad period that period between when the disease could start and when the, the later part, like five weeks, when you can uh, when you can safely apply any fungicides to uh, control this disease. The next comes almond anthracnose. Anthracnose could be difficult to get out of the orchard if you have a history of anthracnose. Uh, the typical symptoms of anthracnose are, are orange sunken lesions on the developing nut. And when these uh, spores reach and infect the nut, the kernel inside, uh, they can uh, they can start perfume is coming. And this coming is typical uh, amber colored gum. Anthracnose can also uh, cause uh, marginal um, marginal cankers um, on the uh, on the on the edges of the leaves, and the leaves dry and uh, they die, but they still remain on the tree. So these are typical symptoms, and anthracnose can also move to uh, to the to the wood and stay there. Uh, so it's, it's very important to monitor anthracnose because if you have it in orchard, you have to start the man management program, uh, and you may have to do this management program for this disease for the next many years if you have uh, high incidence of anthracnose. And uh, I will talk later uh, about uh, the confusion between the anthracnose and bacterial spot symptoms. Uh, sometimes the gumming symptoms may look similar, uh, but there is a difference uh, between those two. Almond scab is one of those diseases that could be monitored during the uh, dormant spot sampling. Scab uh, lesions look like oil colored uh, oil uh, lesions, uh, dark lesions on the twigs. So this is this fungus survives in the twigs for the next year. So that's why we sample the dormant spurs and it could it could stay in the spurs and twigs and carry the inoculum to the next year. Scab can quickly defoliate your trees. Uh, these are uh, these are the lesions that start as light yellow specks on the leaves, which are the the mature uh, lesions. They are oily patches on the leaves. So it can cause defoliation. And by the time you see these uh, oily patches on the leaves, uh, it may already be too late. So uh, again, the typical uh, treatment timings for scab is two to five weeks after petal fall. Now, bacterial spot of almonds, this is a relatively new disease, um, and it is more common in some of the varieties like Fritz and Padre, uh, but it has also been seen in some other varieties too. Uh, bacterial spot is caused by a bacteria, and it can cause profuse coming. And this inoculum is carried in the mummy nuts as well, so proper sanitation during the winter months is critical. Uh, so. Okay, so um, it could also uh, cause uh, you know, dark lesions on the on the leaves. Uh, so bacterial spot uh, can quickly spread uh, through irrigation water or through rain splashes, and uh, it can cause uh, nut drop, heavy nut drop uh, during this time of the year, uh, from spring to early summer, and it can also um, it can also get carried to the next season through, uh, through the mummy nuts and through uh, the uh, twigs. So here is a little chart showing the difference between the bacterial spot. Um, both have gumming, amber colored gumming, but the gumming uh, is different in anthracnose versus bacterial spot. In anthracnose, uh, you would see the, the sunken orange lesion. Uh, but here in the bacterial spot, you have uh, gumming, which is uh, the gumballs, uh, tiny gumballs on the nuts, which uh, are more similar to the gumballs that are created by the leaf-footed bug damage. But the difference from the leaf-footed bug damage is in the leaf-footed bug, uh, the gum is clear. Uh, but in the case of bacterial spot, the gum is amber colored. So again, uh, uh, they have been uh, 
the research is um, going on uh, for uh, management for bacterial spot, uh, but copper applications early in the season have uh, been shown to help uh, from uh, bacterial spot. The next disease that we will be monitoring for in April is autumn area. Autumn area can be an issue, uh, especially in the orchards where you have uh, poor ventilation, and it. Alton area is a problem where, um, where you have uh, high moisture in the canopy and the air is stagnant. And especially, it is true for the east-west plantings. Last year, I uh, visited a few blocks in Kerman area where uh, they had alternate area problem. And the orchards were poorly ventilated. Uh, so this could be, um, this is the disease that is uh, Initially, I talked about the uh, microclimate-based monitoring. Uh, this is the disease that is favored by microclimatic situations like high moisture in the canopy and uh, poor ventilation. So you have to have good ventilation in your orchard. Uh, and if you have uh, alternaria or if you suspect uh, that you could have alternaria, you should be monitoring it as early as uh, early April. And um, this is the disease severity value model that is developed by UC IPM people. And um, this, is, this model is originally taken from tomatoes and uh, modified for almonds. So uh, the full um, model is available on the UC IPM website. So this model actually take, uh, puts values to the mean temperatures in your orchards and for how long those mean temperatures and the wet leaf wetness uh, remains. Uh, so it provides values for mean temperatures and the leaf wetness and the number of hours. And then the disease severity value for those ranges. So the idea is that when the accumulated index values over a seven day period reach a value of 10 or higher, then you should be applying a fungicide. So if you want to learn more about this model or more about alternative monitoring, you can contact uh, either uh, me or uh, David and we can, we can lead you to uh, the proper uh, model and the management tools. So uh, the, the last disease that I would talk about is uh, rust. Rust can be uh, present uh, from previous years in and it can be present sporadically in your orchard, especially uh, if you have uh, your tree rows along the stream or water channel, and especially on the edge rows. Uh, rust can also quickly defoliate your trees. So the rust uh, specks appear as the yellow specks on the upper side of the leaves, and by the time spores are produced and they are pushed through the leaf down to the lower surface, they are rust-colored spores, and they spread very quickly through the, through the moisture. Uh, so, and then again, in case of rust, monitoring during the fall, especially during the late fall rains, is very important if you have rust inoculum in your orchard in the fall. Um, the UC recommendation is to, uh, to do early defoliation so that you can uh, shed the leaves down uh, so that the inoculum is not carried away to the next season. Uh, so the, the, if you have a history of rust, uh, you can start uh, applications early, between two to five weeks after petal fall. And then you may have to, depending on the severity of the disease, you may have to carry on uh, the applications later on in the season, uh, maybe in, into June or July. Uh, but uh, catching the disease early and before the rust appears, in your orchard, uh, taking uh, steps early would be better. Uh, so, and the, the other disease that um, I wanted to talk about will be hull rot, but I think I will be, uh, uh, I'll be talking about hull rot in my uh, May 28 uh, Kerman Symposium talk. So I want uh, all of you to attend uh, the Kerman Symposium. And since um, hull rot appears uh, during those, um, during June and July, anytime, uh, during those times, so I think we should be um, uh, we should be good on that. So the basic uh, spring and summertime diseases that we should be looking out would be these. And if you have any other concerns or questions, uh, you can give me a call or call David. Uh, and I would uh, I would urge you strongly to please register for the Omar Symposium and uh, make this. Thank you. Uh, first of all,
question about um, the pictures that you had. Um, are those ones that are the, on the IPM website? Yeah, they are on the UCI IPM website. Can you speak a little bit uh, about lower limb dieback, or is that still kind of a serious thing? Uh, yeah. I've seen a lot in the southern part of the state. Is it related to Right, so we then, if you have seen uh, certain instances of lower limb dieback, uh, we need to speak because uh, we have a new extension plant pathologist uh, who was, um, we were discussing last week, we were together on a farm call and we were discussing to start sampling and to, um, to go visit the trees that have lower limb dieback. Uh, but um, the, there are uh, certain hypotheses about a lower limb dieback and uh, as, uh, so far, uh, Dr. Bruce Lampinen had done uh, some studies on the lower limb dieback, and they found some relationship between the uh, uh, flood irrigation cycles and uh, too quickly drying and too quickly wetting of the profile, uh, and uh, and the lower limb dieback happening as uh, uh, as a tree response to to that situation. Uh, but that still needs to be verified, and uh, the research still needs to be done on that. I got a question about your fungicide. You were talking about fungicides there. Now they're mixing it, you know, with the chemical compounds. They're putting like, say, Luna, with like a one and a three. And then uh, you might have Scala that has a three and a six. How's that? You know, we want to trade off uh, chemical compounds, and now they're mixing them together, and that's pretty tough to do with some of the chemicals. So for, for that question, I think um, I will refer to Dave. Do you, do you have any advice on the mixing fungicides? Because I so when you have those pre mix fungicides, the idea is you rotate both up, away from both the chemistries that are in those pre mixtures, and and I mean they put them together to help manage. And, and there's a couple different rationales on it. One, they're slightly different chemistries that they may be bottling together into pre mixed. It's easier to handle, um, but you know. I, you, it still suggests that you rotate away from both of those frac groups when you make success, successive spray. So if you use Pristine, which is a 7-Eleven, I think, yeah. right? So then you need to make sure you rotate away from both the Bosclid, the Frac 7, and the Strobular group, which is 11 on that next spray. So you need to use like a, a, a DMI, which is a Frac 3. Yeah, sometimes it gets hard to, to switch those around because a lot of them will have at least one of those numbers in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I mean, I, I'm very lukewarm on, I understand why they mix them together. Yeah, me too. Um, but I also feel that it, it does tend to tie your hands when you're you're trying to figure out multiple spray programs. Thankfully, it's been dry. We haven't had right. overly had to spray, but if we were in a wet cycle, you could easily burn through multiple, you know, making back-to-back -back applications of the same frac group very easily. Right. So I... I, I usually encourage that if you use, let's say, a lot of people like to spray pristine at full bloom. Just to give an example, not saying you should. Right. Uh, but I usually like to see them come in and break that up with chlorothalonil or a broad spectrum coming in at that petal fall or, or spray somewhere on there. So then they, they have something they rotated away for that scab or that rust spray that they're going to make further on in the season. Okay. Once you rotate it away, how quickly can you rotate back? The next application, so the question was, once you rotate away from a frac, when can you apply that same one at that uh, same group again? Once you rotate away, it opens up everything except for what you sprayed previously. That's the idea. And it's just a numbers game. I mean, so if you imagine you're spraying and you have one that survives the strobe learn spray, and you go, and it reproduces and makes a bunch of babies, a hundred babies, and you go through and you spray strobe you learn again, you're not gonna kill those hundred, then they'll make a thousand. Um, but if you spray something else, you'll kill those back to maybe just a population of one again and it has to re go through that growth curve. So it's just a numbers game. With all these chemistries, I mean, this is, the reason why chemistries burn out, whether it's herbicide, insecticide, fungicide, it's it's over-reliance on a single mode of action. And we, we've all seen that with glyphosate. I think we all know what we mean when we talk about resistance, when we think about weeds and glyphosate. Um, but you know, it, what we need to do is just always try to do our best. It's not always possible when we start getting into these complex mixes, but making sure at least one of those tank partners are different is always a good thing to do. If both is possible, that's even better. And then of course, always making sure you need to spray the material in the first place. So 
um, you know, that's always the other component.